Good evening. Thank you for joining. I believe we still have a few people scrolling into our uh, meeting here, so we'll give them a moment to connect. Today's presentation will be recorded, so we, we appreciate you um, coming out of the sunshine to uh, participate and learn a little bit about uh, preservation research and uh, opportunities. Um, I'm Jason Hoddle. I'm one of the Columbus Landmarks board members. And tonight we have with us Angela O'Neill from the Columbus Metropolitan Library and Barbara Powers uh, from the State Historic Preservation Office, Ohio History Connection. Um, we're gonna start with um, Angela's presentation on the um, My History Online Research Tool. And, um, and we'll have some questions followed by that. And then we'll move into Barb's presentation. Uh, but first, thank Angela, thank you for joining us. Um, Angela is the manager of local history and genealogy at Columbus Metropolitan Library. Um, she has a master's degree from Kent State and um, graduated from the History Leadership Institute in 2009 and Leadership Columbus in 2015. Um, Angela was also awarded the Society of Ohio Archivists Award, Award of Merit in 2012, and um, the Ed Lentz Prize by our organization in 2021. We're very excited to have Angela with us today. Um, she serves as the Vice Chair of the American Library Association's History Section. So we've got some great knowledge and experience there. Angela, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jason, and thank you, um, Patty and Becky and everyone at Landmarks for um, inviting me to be here with you today. I'm going to share my screen. Just give me just a moment to get that all organized. I don't think that worked, did it? Are you seeing it, it, property research at Columbus Metropolitan Library? Yes, we are. Thank all right. you. Perfect, sorry about that. All right, so I am gonna take you in the next 15 minutes through the nuts and bolts of what you can do to find out the history of a property um, in Columbus. So everything I'm gonna tell you is online at on our Researching Your House History tutorial, which we have spent a lot of time putting together with our entire librarian team. Um, and this is really specific to Columbus, so it's got everything you need. Um, so if you want to do the in-depth research, go there. Um, we also have a house history class that's recorded on Crowdcast that's, I think, like two and a half hours long. <laughs> so if you want the full version, um, that's a good option, too. So most common questions we get, how old is my house? Who lived there? And how can I get a photograph? And then what else? So um, I decided for tonight, I've always been interested in the St. Paul AME Church Annex. This is right there on 620, 628 Long, um, right there by the, um, the, um, on the Long Street Bridge. I've always wondered what, what the history was in that building. So I'm going to kind of show you a little bit about how we go about doing that research at the library. And I chose this one because I'm interested in it, but also because it's in one of um, Landmark's priority, five priority neighborhoods. So I wanted to make sure that I was being specific about that tonight as well. So first thing you want to do before you start getting into too many of the library's resources is go to the Franklin County Auditor site. They have um, actually a ton of resources there about specific properties. Um, it can be a little hard to find, but the historical transfer sheets are what you're looking for. You go to transfers and there's a little tiny link at the bottom of the page that's historical transfer sheets, and they're all of these PDFs of the of individual properties. So you can learn a lot here. Um, you see in the, towards the bottom left here, this starts at, in, in April, 1920. That doesn't actually mean that this building was built in April, 1920. That's just when these transfer sheets start. So there's probably something going on before that. Um, you get the list of property owners from 1920 forward. So we've got the Miller family, um, the um, Estes Ernest, um, Sawyer, Flora G, which is actually Swayer, and I'll tell you why later, um, and Columbus Home Laundry Company, and then in 1962, it becomes part of St. Paul AME Church. So there's a whole lot of history right there 
in this um, Franklin County Auditor site. Um, you also want to make sure at this point that you keep track of the East Park Place edition because that's going to help you get to the information on the Franklin County Recorder's website. And lot number 137 is going to be important later as well. So start there. Then go to the Recorder's Office website. The Recorder's Office website is somewhat complicated. We do a whole class on that. So I'm not going to go into that too much tonight. But um, that's the, the image on the bottom left there is one of the early deeds um, for this property, which gets us back to about 1915. We found this one. And then um, some things you can do in person at the library, the city directory here, this is the 1911 city directory, that's a street address search so it starts at 620 there's 628 highlighted in red. Um, with a WM Smith Smith Medicine Company, so we know that the, this building was there in 1911 gets us back that far. Um, and then we can keep going back further until we don't find the building anymore. So that's gonna get us a date. Um, also the Sanborn maps are super popular, you see in the middle there. So those are gonna be in person at Main Library. Um, and then you can go on to our website, My History, which is um, www.columbuslibrary.org slash My History. Um, there's a basic search term for search box. You can go right there and search. Um, I'm gonna show you a couple tricks today though. Um, first, you're going to want to go into the advanced search, use that collection search box and search some very specific collections. In this case, we're going to do the MLS cards. These are the multiple listing service cards. Um, we were able to loan um, about 100,000 of these cards that were found at Carriage Trade, Carriage Trade Realty have them all scanned and indexed. So they're a great resource for homes in Columbus and really central Ohio um, that were sold between about the 50s to the 70s. So that's one thing we're gonna wanna search on. And in this case, we're just gonna search Long Street and you'll see um, when we get there that they're batched by street. So you have to get to the street and then you can find the specific address you're looking for. So this is our 628 long. We find it and it looks pretty different than it looks today, which is I think amazing to find a picture like this. Um, if, if, you, if it's hard to see there, it's the Columbus Home Laundry Cleaners. And you see that the there's a um, kind of second row of windows that isn't there anymore. Um, but essentially this, and this little addition here off on the left side, but essentially the building's pretty much intact. The other side of this card also tells us, um, this photo was taken in 1960. You can see there on the right, it was up for sale because the owners were retiring. So that's kind of a fun thing to know. Um, it, with all of these cards too, they give you a little bit of information about the, the building. For homes, they'll tell you even things like what the appliances were and what the carpet was and just all kinds of great details. Um, that are important if you're trying to restore or just want to know about a property. So this was sold in 1960 for 46,500. Um, and I'll tell you more about that later too. So the next thing you're going to want to do then is do a um, browse by map, which you can also find just a little bit further down at that columbuslibrary.org slash my history. The, um, everything that we have digitized so far that we have an address for is going to show up as a pin on this map. The blue dots are where there's multiple pins. So if you zoom in, those will just turn into regular pins as well. You can also use that drop down to select the neighborhood. Not everything has an address, but sometimes we know what neighborhood it is, but just not the specific address to place it on a map. So you actually get a lot more in there. So I like to do this um, search because it really gives me the context for a, for a building or for a home. You can really understand the neighborhood and sometimes you can even find the building that you're looking for um, kind of to the side in something else. I didn't actually find that in this one, but I did find this is further down um, on Long Street by Lincoln Theater, but I just wanted you to see this other photo that comes up that shows, you know, the density of the buildings here, um, and you can kind of click around 
on that map to get an understanding of the neighborhood, which I think is really important to understand um, why there would be a, a, a home laundry right there where, you know, today that of course probably wouldn't be able to exist, but you've got all this residential and, and community um, of these properties here. What else can you find? This is the fun part, I think, too. So in my history, we've digitized a lot of newspapers. We also have the Columbus Dispatch Digital, um, which is the dispatch digitized back to 1879. You can find amazing things with an address search in these databases. So really, this is a lot of the history of the house right here from the newspaper, which a lot of people don't think newspapers are, are going to find that much for you. But we find um, the first entry for 628 East Long is in, in 1900 in the Columbus Dispatch, and it looks like it's a boarding house, 10 rooms, um, 628 East Long Street, gas, bath, $28. Um, by 1929, remember we saw um, Ernest Estes, I think, um, was the owner at one point. This is Estes Tire and Battery Service, so it went through a time when it was um, that and I think that was connected to Goodyear. I think that's part of a larger Goodyear ad that I cropped just to be able to show you tonight. Um, by 1945, actually long before 1945, really, it is it become does become the Columbus Home Laundry, and we find this article on the right here where um, Captain C. H. Swayer Jr. Remember, we thought it was Sawyer on the transfer sheets. Um, is home from the war. 1945 would have been the end of World War II. He's spending a 15-day furlough at the home of his parents, Mr. and Mrs. C.H. Swayer. Um, and prior to his enlistment three years ago, Swayer was associated with his father, who's owner of the home laundry company, 628 East Long Street in Columbus. Um, and um, Captain Swayer, of course, here is a veteran of 71 flying missions, holder of the Distinguished Flying Cross and Air Medal with seven oak leaf clusters. So you get a whole history in many ways of this family, um, just with an address search. Um, and then it says, we remember it was sold to um, St. Paul a &E in the early 60s. So I just I included a Columbus Home Laundry and Dry Cleaners um, ad from the newspaper as well. So really you're able to, just with a few um, different searches on the address, um, understand more about the history of the property there. So that is a short and sweet property history. <laughs> and I will tell you um, to pull this together, that's a couple hours worth of research that I just can for you, but we are happy to do this kind of work with you at the library and love to hear your questions and help people find more information about properties that they're looking for. So you're welcome to email us at history at columbuslibrary.org. We also have a reserve and expert program where you can set up an appointment with a librarian and we'll walk you through the process of finding, about, finding out about your home or a property that um, you may be interested in um, adding to the National Register. We get those questions a lot and that's gonna segue right into Barb's talk here in a few minutes. Um, and I also just wanted to mention finally that um, all library locations are open and we will be at our full normal hours starting Monday the 21st. So that's Monday through Thursday 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., Saturday 9 to 6 and Sunday 1 to 5. So we're back and we're ready for your, your, your questions in person, um, online, or by email. And for now, I'll take some questions. So the short and sweet property history and how to use my history talk. I'm going to stop my screen here so I can see you again. There we go. For questions, if it's easiest, um, the, there's a chat button at the bottom of your screen. Yeah. And you're yeah. welcome to put those questions into that chat. And we will um, ask Angela to, to answer them. Um, I might start with one. Um, you know, we, we know that at many of our fabulous library locations, there are computers and things available for folks to use. Um, is the when when you when you talked about your reserve um, someone to help out? Is that at all the library locations? Is that a, a specific one, or what? How do, how does that work? Well, the 
Yeah, that's actually a virtual Zoom call that we do with you. So it, our um, local history librarians at Maine um, take those calls and you can be at another library branch, you can be at your house, anywhere where you are. Um, we'll just Zoom in to, with you and, and do those calls. But you can also just come into the library. We um, staff our reference desk all the hours that we're open. So there's always someone there that can help you um, do this process as well. And we love to do it. I can't tell you enough how much we love to do this kind of work. So <laughs> we're happy to help. We have a question uh, from Joe that says, can you explain about the records fire and how it may hinder our search. I don't know any details, just that there was a fire and records were lost. Yeah, um, it really depends on the search that you're trying to do and how far back you're trying to go. Um, for the most part, we have, um, we still have the complete deed books and we still have mostly the com mostly complete plat books. So um, the um, fire that happened was more um, other kinds of records. So we're able to do a lot of property research. We're able to do less work in terms of um, more genealogy kind of records, like some of the early um, Columbus probate and birth records and those kinds of things are a little less complete. So for property research, you should be okay uh, for the most part. But every neighborhood's a little different. I'll just qualify it with that too. There's another question that says, um, um, for very old houses are listed on the auditor's site as old and or built mm -hmm. in 1920. Where are the older records? Yeah, so the older records are still at the um, Franklin County Auditor's Office, and they're they're in the old books at that point. So at that point, you're looking through original books. Um, give or again, give or take, assuming that you know they still exist, um, and which they do for the most part. But if I don't put that caveat on there, I'll get someone whose whose home isn't in the books. Um, so they, they do exist for the most part um, at the auditor's office. That being said, um, we, can, we can do a lot without even those records um, through the process. I didn't go too much into the process of um, kind of um, cross correlating, I guess, um, the city directories and maps um, and the um, recorder's office, you can really get to um, a good understanding of um, when a home was built without the um, Franklin County auditor's records. But does that, if that doesn't answer your question, whoever put that in the chat, um, I can go into more detail. So I have a question that uh, is my own. Uh, the Sanborn maps, the city directories, are those things ever going to be digitized or are they? Or do yeah, we have to? Yeah, we are, we're working on that. So, but I can tell you all of the Sanborn maps are already digitized and you can go into my history tonight and take a look at those. You'll want to limit to the Columbus and I think it's Columbus and Central Ohio map collection. Um, and then from there, you can type in Sanborn or you can just browse. Um, we've actually digitized all of the maps that we have cataloged at the library. They're all going to be available online. Um, we do have a lot of people, though, myself included, that find that it's easier really to navigate the Sanborns in person, just the way they're organized. Um, is easier, but then if you do ever want the high resolution, high resolution image, um, it's easy to go on and just download it. We have a lot of people that like to hang those up, you know, in their in their homes when they when they find them. Um, and city directories, um, there's a, a little bit of a different process there. Um, we have digitized. Um, all of the city directories that we have at the library that are not already on ancestry.com. Um, so they've digitized most of them. We filled in about a dozen or so. Um, those will stop being digitized around 1955. Um, there was a long story short, there was a lawsuit that's making its way through federal court where um, the um, 
copyright heirs of the Polk Company that did the Polk City directories sued Ancestry to have them stop digitizing um, city directories. So we're waiting to hear how that goes before anyone digitizes any further past 1955. But for the moment, those are available on Ancestry, which you can get at any library location, um, main library in all of our 22 branches for free. And we can show you how to navigate directly to the city directories on that too, if you're interested in doing that work. So for the folks that are on, can, on telephones or not possibly looking at the comments, I will just, um, we don't have any more questions, but we do have a thank you, a couple of thanks. So we have, thank you so much for a succinct presentation that was informative with respect to the library's resources. And we have a shout out uh, that says, shout out to Angela and the local history and genealogy team. They've been a true partner to Columbus Landmarks and we rely on their expertise and research assistance, especially with the buildings nominated to the annual most endangered sites list. So I will, um, I will agree with those thanks. We really appreciate your presentation and hope you'll stay on to in case there are any further follow-up questions as we go through. And um, we'll now move over to Barb Powers uh, Barb is the Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer and Department Head for Inventory and Registration for the, the State Historic Preservation Office of the Ohio History Connection. She has almost 40 years of experience with historic survey and the National Register of Historic Places programs in Ohio. Um, Barb has an impressive list of published works and has researched and lectured on late 19th and early 20th century architectural topics. Um, if you've been on one of her tours or lectures, and I have, um, you know that we're going to get some great content from Barb today. So Barb, we look forward to um, hearing about the National Register of Historic Places. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Jason. Um, let me share my screen and... All right, can everyone see that? Yes. All right, great. Um, thank you again, and thank you, uh, Jason, Patty, and Becky for inviting me to be a part of this panel. And Angela, wow, thanks, that was great. Um, we certainly benefit from a lot of those research sources. Now, my portion, I hope, is as succinct, but there's certain things about the National Register I always feel compelled I have to share because of uh, all the programs, I think, you know, there's so many uh, myth myths that get uh, um, associated with the National Register. So I always have to um, share through um, some of those aspects. So this is going to be a pretty uh, quick whirlwind tour of the National Register program. And I'm gonna uh, walk through uh, fairly quickly um, a sample of a nomination, uh, but this is basically the application of your diligent research through the um, library and with Angela's uh, folks. And just for, as a quick introduction, the State Historic Preservation Office is a division of the Ohio History Connection. And we carry out for the state of Ohio and throughout the state of Ohio, the uh, programs and requirements associated with the National Historic Preservation Act. So this just lists all of those aspects. We develop a statewide plan. We uh, work with people doing statewide survey of historic places and archeological sites. We, of course, work with the folks who are applying for and taking advantage of the historic uh, rehabilitation tax credits for both the federal and state tax credits. We work with um, consulting with federal agency and recipients of federally funded prop projects for their effects on historic properties. And we do education programs. Tonight, we are going to do a snapshot of the National Register of Historic Places. The National Register really is the cornerstone of the federal National Historic Preservation Program because it tells people they have properties that are worthy of historic preservation because of their significance in 
uh, American history, architecture, archaeology, engineering, culture, and those properties are evaluated at either a local, state, or national level of significance. And I can tell you, of all those over 4,000 listings or nominations we have in Ohio throughout the state, the majority of them tell a local story and focus on local significance. Uh, now, the National Register, as I said, tells people, property owners, local officials, interested groups, citizens, that they have something worthy of historic preservation. But for the most part, it leaves that decision making about how to preserve that property at the hands of the property owner, local decision makers. So what does the National Register not do? The National Register does not change a property owner's rights as a property owner. It's not going to, if your property is listed in the National Register, you're not gonna to have to be required to repair or remodel or uh, be prohibited from uh, doing work on the property or alter and selling or even demolishing it with other than federal funds. Um, National Register listing should not be confused with local, a local designation, like in the Columbus Register of Historic Places, um, which does set up a local design review process in which there, there is a look, a look at uh, exterior changes made to a property. But that, that is a local process created by local ordinances and not uh, automatically an outcome of the National Register. That's something that people sometimes get um, uh, misunderstand. So what does the National Register do? Well, ultimately it is a planning and an educational tool. As I said, it tells you you have a significant property um, worthy of preservation. Um, it does do some tangible benefits and probably by far the most uh, popular and most actively used is the fact that income producing properties, that would be commercial or residential rental, that are listed individually or contributing to a historic district listed in the National Register may qualify for historic rehabilitation tax credits for work that's done to reuse, rehabilitate the historic property. Um, there in Ohio, there's also a complementary state historic preservation tax credit that uh, works together with the federal historic preservation tax credit. So the federal is a 20%, the state is 25. So that is the potential for a combined 45% tax credit on work that is putting the building, putting a building back into reuse, uh, back into contributing to the economic development and reinvestment of a community in a neighborhood. Um, properties that are listed in the National Register or determined eligible also uh, receive special consideration when there are federally funded or federally licensed or permitted projects that may be impacting um, those historic properties. And that is a process, routine planning process of any project that's receiving federal funds or requires such a federal permit. And it doesn't always mean that the property doesn't um, disappear through the project as a result of the project, but it does um, require that there is coordination with our office, that there's a public process put into place in which there's public consideration taken into consideration on the impact of the federally funded project to the historic property. And if that is a negative or adverse effect, there is mitigation determined with consultation of our office to try to mitigate the, the impact to that historic property. So that's just a little bit about the uh, uh, benefits associated with the National Register and um, uh, also what uh, the National Register doesn't necessarily mean when you have a property listed. 
So this tells us a little bit quickly about the National Register process. The National Register process begins with you all. In Ohio, we have a very publicly driven uh, program in which we are working with uh, people who are seeking, for the most part, proactively submitting or publicly driven um, submitting National Register nominations to us. Our office does uh, occasionally prepare National Register nominations or initiate some projects that involve um, um, preparation of National Register, but for the most part, we fill our days with working with uh, individuals and groups and organizations that are seeking to um, nominate properties to the National Register. So there, anyone can nominate a property, and that means you don't have to necessarily be the owner of that property in order to initiate a nomination. However, all property owners are notified through our office um, about the proposed National Register nomination and given an opportunity to comment on that National Register nomination as it moves through the process. There are three major review points for any nomination. Once you as an applicant, as the person that has prepared the nomination, you submit that nomination to the State Historic Preservation Office, which is housed there at the um, Mid-Century Modern Ohio History Center. And myself and my staff will work with you to make sure you have a successful nomination. And we do a review of the nomination. Typically there's two, two sometimes more drafts of the nomination that's put together um, and prepared. Then every nomination uh, goes to a state level review. And that is um, um, held by, conducted by, a governor appointed board, the Ohio Historic Site Preservation Advisory Board, OSHBAP. And this state review board meets four times a year and they are, they are comprised, their membership is comprised of architects, historians, architectural historians, um, archeologists and public members. And they consider and look at every National Register nomination that's um, nominated in Ohio. And they then provide a recommendation to our office as to whether or not they think the property meets the National Register criteria, has historic integrity, and is listed in the, should be listed in the National Register. Um, the final review is once we've signed the nomination and sent it to the National Park Service. We have a reviewer in Washington, DC that reviews every National Register nomination and they will then make the final decision on listing in the National Register. The process can take from the start when you're working with Angela to do that research to when you get that notification letter to say that it's been listed in the National Register can be roughly up to a year, uh, um, nine to 12 months in total from research to register, um, which includes a lot of deadlines and timeframes associated with it. So what gets listed? Individual buildings can be listed in the National Register, structures are listed, sites like the designed landscape, um, of the Mill Creek Park or objects can be listed in the National Register and also historic districts. And historic districts are a co cohesive grouping of properties that together help to tell their story of their history and their significance for listing in the National Register. So historic districts can be commercial stretches like North Columbus Commercial Historic District, or they can be residential neighborhoods like the Hanford Village, George Washington Carver subdivision. They can be college campuses like Capitol, or they can be in even entire townships like the Elizabeth Township Rural Historic District. 
in Miami County, which is a co collection of historic farmsteads that uh, still retain much of their character and appearance from um, and portray the rich agricultural history of our state. So there are three main ingredients for properties to qualify for the National Register. And first of all, properties typically are 50 years or older. There can be exceptions to that. And properties have to have significance. And then the significance for the National Register is evaluated in one or more of the basic National Register criteria, A, B, C, or D. A, criterion A, are properties that are significant for their association with a single event or a broad pattern of events. Criterion B is associated with individuals, people who have made important contributions to our past. C is about architectural merit, design, materials, method of construction, um, type of building, architectural style of the building. And D are properties that yield important information. These are typically archeological in nature. And then the last ingredient is integrity, historic integrity. And this is really what sets the National Register apart from perhaps other means of documenting a property's history. The National Register is ultimately place-based history, meaning that in addition to telling its historic story and showing how it's significant um, based on one of those criteria, a property still has to retain a sufficient amount of historic physical characteristics that help to show its appearance and convey its appearance at the time it achieved its significance. So we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through our example. So in addition to knowing the specific history of a property, in order for a successful nomination, properties have to be evaluated within an appropriate historic context and be compared to other similar properties. And in doing that, uh, there has to be a reliance on and usage of um, scholarly research evaluation, the types of primary resource materials in part that Angela was showing you. So let's look at a property specifically. This is the Teresa building on Long Street here in Columbus. And it was listed in 2015 and it was listed under criterion A and C. So it was listed um, because of its significance in showing the development of the commercial area of Long Street and its associated African-American uh, neighborhood, and particularly during the time period of the night, beginning in the late early 20th century into the 1920s. So it reflects in part some of the growth and prosperity of this area, um, fueled in part by the great migration into um, Columbus and into the North. And this was a professional building, um, and commercial building developed by um, James Albert Al Jackson. And it was named Teresa after Jackson's wife. So this is the cover form and here's a photograph coverage showing the current appearance of this building. It was an individual nomination. So we see through the photographic coverage in the nomination, the exterior of the building, some of the details of the building, but also the interior. Um, and some of the interior details. There's a narrative description that's part of the nomination and in it, you provide an overview explaining the setting and some of the, the context, if you will, of the setting and the location of the property. And then just basically the property is described, interior, exterior, all sides, interior, details, alteration. Um, just in a text narrative type of uh, format. It's cross-referenced to those photos that you saw on the other slide. And then 
in this section seven is where um, the significance of the property is linked then to that those physical characteristics to convey its historic significance. And historic significance is evaluated by location, setting, design, materials. So it's understanding what did the property look like historically and when it was significant, what does it look like? How has it changed? What's it look like now? What are those essential physical features that a property has to retain and had to retain to tell that it uh, to convey its historic significance? The section seven, which is talking about, it's taking that his specific history of the property and then it's uh, tying it back into and placing it within that historic context. For, for the Teresa building, they were focusing specifically on the commercial development of um, the Longstreet area between the time periods of 1925, you see period of significance to 1965, and focusing on areas of significance of commerce, community development, Black history, and specifically the architecture under criterion C. So the nomination didn't start telling about the founding of Columbus from its earliest days. It drilled right down and started talking about Longstreet, the surrounding neighborhood, how it developed, and particularly during that time period of the 20s, and how um, Mr. Jackson was uh, instrumental in the development and in building and creating this building that turned out to be used for professional offices and also commercial uses. That comparative analysis came in comparing it to other properties associated with Jackson who had developed or had been involved in some other properties and also other similar uh, commercial buildings being built at the same time. This building stands out in part because of its distinctive um, mission architecture style with some very distinctive um, features and um, design features. And then there was also supporting materials. There's mapping to clearly show the location of the property. And we always encourage that you include some historic images to help convey that significance and also help reinforce the historic integrity of the building. Here we see a um, um, newspaper article probably derived from the Columbus Metropolitan Library's resources. And it shows the interior of the building, the main primary upper floor interior lobby space. And here it is at the time it was nominated. It has changed very little and that um, can just re help, really help reinforce the historic integrity of this property and help show how it qualifies for the National Register. Now, just to wrap up quickly, the National Park Service has put together a wide variety of what they call National Register bulletins that help guide you through um, the specifics of preparing a nomination. And also are some of them are focused on very specific property types or, or types of nomination. So they give you a lot of um, firsthand uh, direct guidance on preparing nominations. Um, those are, can be accessed through our, our uh, website, ohiohistory.org, or also through the National Park Service website. Sometimes to help build that context and compare to other similar properties, you're gonna wanna know what else is listed on the National Register that's similar to your property. Well, our website has a searchable database in which you can search on the name of the property, the um, architect or the style, or uh, street address, and then you can find a list of similar properties. Um, you can find the ref number. You can then go to the National Park Service or to the National Archives and call up the property itself. Um, and um, the archives is uh, current through listings in 2012. We are in the process of adding all of our National Register um, copies of nominations to our searchable database. So that will be accessing that 
direct right from that source, our website. Um, first step in starting this whole process is to complete a National Register questionnaire. And this is just basically a quick um, initial, uh, tell us what you know about the, your property, give us some photos. Our staff team looks at these weekly and we will then get back with you on advice on whether or not we think you should go that next more involved step of preparing a nomination. Or if at this point, we think there may be some challenges to preparing a successful nomination, we'll tell you that uh, right up front. So I just end with a couple other images of properties that are listed in the National Register and uh, are located in some of those um, targeted neighborhoods that Columbus Landmarks Foundation are doing such great work in. And I just, finish with one more little thing, bear with me, I know I've gone a little longer. The standard building here on 4th and Long Street, what a tale of a, of, of a building. Um, if you all recall, this building was covered over it with a later much non-historic um, um, covering. Well, that was uncovered and this building was nominated and listed in the National Register along with its neighbor, the Winders Motor Sales. And just recently, this picture from our uh, archives library collection was brought to my attention and it was titled, Unidentified Building Being Demolished. Well, we know it wasn't demolished, but even more fascinating is an uh, African-American um, contracting firm was uh, C.W. Bryant, Rigging and Moving. C.W. Bryant was a African-American businessman, and he had a large construction firm. He is, they are associated with this picture, and they were, I think, misidentified, obviously, as helping to demolish the building, but now I am intrigued that they helped build the building, and this is on Long Street, Long and Fourth. So that just also goes to uh, illustrate that nominations can always be amended with new information. And we are always eager to work with people to do that process too. So thank you very much. And as I said, it was a whirlwind tour of the National Register program, but hopefully you have some questions. <laughs> We'll follow that same uh, that same path and put them in the in the comments. Okay. Uh, for those watching the recording or listening on a phone, um, our first comment is from Becky West. Uh, Becky says, "Thank you, Barb, for this informative presentation. Approximately, how many Columbus properties were listed in the National Register in 2021, and how did that compare to previous years? Is oh, it true that Columbus? Oh, go ahead. Is it true that Columbus lags in terms of number of listed properties?" Um, the last count was around 170 or so of the 350 in Franklin County. Well, as of the time of our map, which was February 2022, there are 347 listings, National Register listings in Franklin County. And um, the big C's are our major uh, community, you know, areas, um, Cuyahoga County with Cleveland leads the pack, um, Cincinnati um, and Hamilton County and then Columbus. And um, I mean, it's not a huge gap, but I think, you know, Columbus doesn't have quite as many, Columbus certainly doesn't have as many districts as um, certainly Cleveland and, and Cincinnati do. <laughs> Cleveland, we kind of joke in our office, it's like, it's nothing, if you don't have a listing in Cleveland that overlaps and is listed like in two different districts or nominations, but anyway. But that's only to say that there's plenty out there in Columbus that can be listed and can be nominated. And there's certainly plenty of um, spectacular things that already are, are listed. Um, I can tell you that we barely missed a beat. Uh, <laughs> through 2022 and 2021. We had to cancel one board, one of those four board meetings, the rest of them we carried out. The park service pivoted and created electronic means for us to submit 
um, nominations, which has been a great thing. And in those two years, we listed 75 um, nominations to the National Register, and that included about 25 to 30 historic districts. So we were open for business. <laughs> you may have seen us like this in our little Hollywood Squares format, but, um, and we're, we're, we're still here, we're still, <laughs> We're still, and we're luckily now, certainly, and have been for the last year, been able to make site visits and, and be out there and have a little more uh, in-person type of contact with folks. But um, yeah, overall, uh, I think the National Register may have been a little down in the past year with nationally, with um, um, listings, but, but not by much. Um, You, um, I'll ask a question. Uh, you mentioned the publications that, that are put out by National Park Service. Um, is that pretty pretty self-directive? I mean, if we, we, we pull those, it'll walk us through the process or? They will. Well, and we also have a, a whole uh, online guidance that uh, after we've given you what we call the green light with, the, with a questionnaire or um, otherwise, you know, say yes, we think you definitely should prepare a nomination. We will, and this is available on our website, our more detailed instructions for how to put together all that information and sample nominations. And I will say our organization has just launched a new website. We, we think, we hope it's um, ever, ever more user-friendly, the, the hope, the internal hope of all websites. Um, and we are going to be actively putting on more sample nominations to help guide people because it's a great way to see, see how to successfully do that. The bulletins are uh, pretty self-explanatory, I think, and um, the, how, to, how to evaluate, how to use the National Register criteria, that uh, bulletin is, I think, particularly how to apply the criteria is particularly helpful and it probably has the best explanation that I can give direct you to on thinking about that historic content or that historic integrity, thinking about knowing the significance first and then working backwards to look at your property and see what physical characteristics it has to tell that story. And that also doesn't mean that any, you know, that properties can't change every property changes over time. We saw that with the example that um, Angelus showed us and likewise with the Teresa building, it had changes to it, but it's knowing why it's significant in the first place and then understanding the evolution of it from a physical physical characteristics too. It's, it's just this great detective uh, search to uncover this and again, something Angela said, it's taking that information and sort of co corroborating it. You see one thing in a city directory or you see something on a Sanborn map, can you back that up then with some other source to help reinforce that? And then the ticket though to the National Register is that taking that specific history and then placing it into that larger context and that comparative. And then cinch. You're done, um, but it's fun. And we, you know, I learn something new every day, every day and every time I read a nomination and work with a group and work with somebody to nominate their property. And, uh, you know, Ohio is just, a, a, has a tremendous history as does Columbus. And it's just, it's great fun to work with folks to help them uncover that for a lot of different reasons and motivations for getting your properties listed and recognized. Do we have any other questions? We've exhausted everyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're right on time, so that's good. Has um, anyone ever, uh, this group, prepared a nomination, I wonder, successfully? I know I know some people have. I <laughs> see their names, but. I, I see someone, there she is. <laughs> yeah. I have for um, Glenn Brow, and we did get state, um, approval but we're waiting for the tower which is still under restoration um 
to be completed. We slow down with the pandemic and we're, we're gonna start up again soon. Oh, and that's right. That yes. wonderful modern, mid-century modern building yes. at home. Yes, that's wonderful. Weird. Yeah, but um, they're two, two separate buildings and they were done, you know, over 24 right. years apart, so. Right. And I also want to mention two of your board members, Clyde Henry, who's on the uh, meeting with us tonight, and uh, Doreen Juhas Sauer. They are currently both members of that um, State Historic Preservation Advisory Board, <laughs> of which we have a meeting this Friday. So we have about um, 14 nominations uh, coming up for their consideration. So we really appreciate the expertise that both of them bring to that state review board. And um, I just wanted to give a shout out to Clyde okay. and Doreen, who can't be with us. Um, well, okay, I, also, Jason, just quickly, uh, I'm currently working with Susan and a community group on the Near East Side to um, get recognition for the home of Vincent Walters, a leading musician uh, in the area. And so, you know, we passed the first hurdle. There's more, a lot more to go. Great. I know. We're looking forward to seeing that nomination. <laughs> well, I want to thank both of you for your presentations today. Um, it's incredible the amount of resources that we have. And I'm really proud to be part of an organization like Columbus Landmarks, where we can connect our members to the people who know. Um, I, I, and it's just, you know, just the example of this tonight, you know, we learn where to get something here and how to use it and where to put it there and what the result can be, um, not just for ourselves, but for our friends and neighbors. And um, I'm really, really thankful for your, your time this evening. I know everyone's busy and even more so because, you know, we, we've got sunlight outside. So I suspect some people will be watching this on replay later and um, it will certainly be a good resource for them as well. Um, Becky, Patty, anything else to add? Thank you everyone so much. And Jason and the membership committee, we all look forward to our next gathering, which I'm feeling so confident will be in person. <laughs> we hope so. Thank you everyone. Have a great evening.